Hello, everybody. I'm Sean Reynolds from Sports and about to be joined by Ken Weeb from the Winnipeg Free Press. Together, we are Kenny and Rennie. This is the Kenny and Rennie post game show after win streak alert, everybody. Win streak two straight for the Winnipeg Jets. All's well in Winnipeg after six game losing streak, two straight now for the Winnipeg Jets. Um, a lot of things that I like in this game. Uh, and uh, I, I'll lay them out. First off, um, getting the power play going. Absolutely huge. Um, I'm seeing signs of what we saw from the Winnipeg Jets power play the last time it was healthy. Um, I know a lot of people talk about, you know, you bring a guy like Gabe Velarde back into the lineup and you're thinking, okay, well, yeah, he comes back, but it, this isn't going to be immediate, right? I had thought if there was something that could be a pretty quick transition into getting back to where you were before I had thought that it would be putting Gabe Velarde back into that spot on the power play, just because I'll go back to what I said about this before. I don't think that teams have an answer for what he's doing down there. And now I've seen it. I know he's not the first guy to play it like that, but it's not very common. And I liked Rick bonus when I asked him about this, how a guy, you know, who's, spent more time behind an NHL bench than any other coach in the history of the game sees Gil uh, Gabe Velarde's skill set in that scenario. And he described it as unique. And I love that description. And it's because it aligns with what I think makes this dangerous in, in that what Gabe Velarde does, it's not that easy to defend against. And I remember saying something along the lines of, if the Jets get Gabe Velarde back and get that power play going the way it was before he was injured the last time, it really could be an advantage for them going into the playoffs because I don't know that as it works like that, anyone has found a solution for that. I haven't seen a team drop a really, really good plan to shut down Gabe Velarde when he's playing like that. And so because there's not a lot of tape, because it's a copycat league and quite often what will happen is the Nashville Predators will figure something out and then the Colorado Avalanche will get tape of what the Nashville Predators did and then they will start to follow that. I can't think of any teams that have really come in with a real good game plan that was able to shut that down. To me, I see signs of that coming back. It's not just the goal that happens, uh, but it's the, the many opportunities, the many chances. I know he throws, uh, Gabe Velarde throws a, a backhanded no-look pass through the skates and it's stopped by a defender. He called it a hope play. Sometimes that's what you're doing is, is trying to pull off hope plays, but you know, those opportunities, if they get through uh, and they will in the future, th those end up in the back of the net. And so really liked what I saw from the power play, which, you know, Rick Bonus had talked quite a bit about the Jets and saying the power play is losing them games. This is a night 4-2, 5-2 victory with an empty netter, but 4-2, uh, you're essentially talking about your power play being the difference on this night. Um, so really, really like that too. The way that the Winnipeg Jets have shut down the game the last couple of games. So both games to me start off, and this is another one where Connor Hellebuck was good early because there were these like five alarm fire, you know, the, the, the Calgary Flames, I had to leave from watching in the press box and go down to do the, uh, the Calgary Flames broadcast on Sportsnet. Um, but I, before I left, I think there were five shots by the Calgary Flames. But like to me, it felt like there had been like five or six really good opportunities in tight. What you saw from the Jets is they, they're doing a really good job of playing with the lead, right? Now that they know that they've got that advantage on you, they get the back pressure going. They really snuff kind of everything out. They use the advantage. They know that the teams are going to have to, you know, like try and get down ice. They know where they have to go to try and create opportunities to get back into the game. And they're snuffing that out the last couple of games. Uh, and I, to be honest with you, I think they were snuffing it out for the most part against the Ottawa Senators uh, and then just take a bad penalty in that case. And suddenly it's in the back of your net on the power play. But having the confidence to go into a game and, you know, the Jets being back to being or, or looking like they're getting back to being that team that's in these tight games, tight game against L.A., tight game against the, the Calgary Flames for a bit there. 
and being able to lock it down confidently and having the kind of effort that I saw from players. I mean, Nick, Nick Ehler stands out to me as flying back one time uh, just to create some back pressure. And it's not just him. It was everyone on this night. Nemeskov was the guy who kind of was eye popping and doing it uh, tonight. But just that commitment to shutting them down, I thought is that, that is such a huge tool to have in your toolkit going into the playoffs. Rick Bonus talked about wanting to have good habits. That's a good habit to have, right? To be, hey, we're up in a game and we know how to close this out. We know how to shut it down. You didn't see those a, a lot of those opportunities in tight the way that you saw in the first two periods. They played their best period in the third period when they smelled blood and knew how to shut it down. That's a good one. But to me, maybe the the most impressive thing that I saw was in the post game from Gabe Velarde when he was asked questions about where they were and he pointed out some big flaws in their game. He said, basically the second period we were outplayed for the, the second period for a good chunk of the first period, we were outplayed as well. And he says, it's not one, two, three shifts. It's getting to be like an entire period. And to me, this was a characteristic of, of what we saw happening to the jets in in that six game losing streak right like just failing to show up for entire swaths of the game now let's not be let, let, let's be honest here the calgary flames came in here people who cover the team were referring to them to me as a sacrificial lamb apparently there's open conversations in that dressing room of players just wanting this to be over and playing out the stretch this is a team that if the winnipeg jets played that good chunk of the second like they did and a good chunk the first half of the first period the way that they did that kept this game really close against a good playoff team we're probably not talking about a victory here on this night uh the jets can't be doing that and the fact that gave already came out i think the old jets team that i used to cover would have been like no nah, no nah, no nah. we found a way to win we came we showed up at the right time blah blah and would have talked about all the things they thought they did right to come away with a victory against a team that you should be beating at this time of year in this position if you are a contending team and they never really talked lots about that yeah but we're not doing this and that's a problem and we need to fix that problem i love that kind of conversation because to me it shows a team not afraid to point to the skeletons that they have in the closet not afraid to point to the issues that they need to fix and to me someone pointing to the issues they need to fix always shows confidence or at least that they are invested in trying to fix those problems. Uh, as the Jets are trying to get better, I've said this before, the wins and the losses at this stage, they don't mean a lot to me. What means a lot to me is getting their game where it needs to be and identifying that there are swaths of that game that were unacceptable on this night, but that the Jets got away with it is a very, very important step, I think, in trying to make sure that the next six games start snowballing and having this team look more and more and more like what they want to get back to that team that they looked like uh right before christmas time uh acknowledging your faults is a good thing in my mind something this team didn't do enough before good to see a guy like gabe velarde who led the charge on the ice tonight to be leading the charge in the dressing room afterwards that's my take on the whole thing time to bring in the man with the best music in the business for his take here comes kenny everybody Kenny, I woke up this morning uh, and it was like a clairvoyance. It was just like this. Suddenly everything was so clear in my mind. And I remembered back to a time that I was at Vittorio Rossi, which I went to to go get my uh, suits. Uh, so, so the playoff suits getting ready. Jets are getting ready for the playoffs. 
uh, Rennie's getting ready for the playoffs and it's like a day at the spa heading down with Frankie and the boys as they were taking care of business. But I remember being in there with this suit that has a very subtle yellow pinstripe uh, alongside the black pinstripe that you probably can't pick up on the camera there. But I saw it before, about it. About this tie and how well it worked with it. And I'd forgot about it. This tie I probably have not wet, used for four years. And I went and it was just like, I woke up and it was like, my mind was just like the gray suit with the yellow tie. And I walked and I threw it on and walked in and showed the wife. And, and it was like, yes. And so I guess it's just one of these things where it was knowledge bestowed upon me knowledge is power, by Frankie and the boys years ago. And like adult, I completely forgot about it for all those years. But at some point that knowledge came to fruition on a day like this today. Thanks to Frankie and the boys. Uh, I know you're looking good uh, because Frankie and the boys make sure that you look good. But uh, if you want to have these kind of knowledge bombs that Frankie and the boys can bestow on you, besides making you look like a million bucks, head on down to Vittorio Rossi on Corden Avenue, Walk in, loudly proclaim Kenny and Rennie sent you. Ask for Frankie or any of the boys, and they will do you up right down there. Kenny, what did you see out there tonight? Yeah, a lot of what you did, and uh, I would agree. I mean, I was right in the gamer tonight, so I wasn't able to get down to the room, but uh, certainly looking at Gabriel Velarde's quotes, uh, I love the fact that he was very honest and open about the fact that the Jets need a little bit more at times here, and that, you know, yes, there were good things, but uh, I loved what he said about, you know, not not being happy and that they had a lot of work to do. I mean, that's, these are facts, right? I mean, this is, uh, you know, these are facts. We know that the Jets are trying to ramp up their game uh, as they play these final six after this win today. But like, there's still, there's still work to do. Like, I'm not the coach, but I'd say we've got to clean up things. We were having breakdowns where I feel we're getting out work, not for a few shifts, but for the whole period. And we can't have that. I mean, that's, This is, this sounds like, you know, rudimentary knowledge, but it's factual and it's something that we haven't uh, heard enough of, as you mentioned. And I think that comes back to accountability. And that's been a common theme for this group over the course of the year. Uh, I'm with you. I think, you know, the Jets only had one game this year where they've had three power play goals. And today they had two. Uh, I would say that they had a, you know, big missed opportunity on the five on three. I would say that's something where you, when you have an extended five on three, you got to cash in. And now to the Jets credit, Velarde gets the redirection goal on a beautiful pass by Kyle Connor with 10 seconds left in the second minor. So they at least weren't, you know, you know, completely washed out on the five on three situation. Uh, but I would say that that's, again, we're talking about being sharp and, and when the, when the margins are so slim, when it comes to the playoffs, Sean, you get a five on three in a playoff game, you got to cash in on it, right? Like this is, if you're playing Colorado in round one, and you're the Jets, and you get a five on three, you better cash in on it. Otherwise, like that's that's a gift, right? That's a gift given from above. Uh, and when you don't cash in, it can be deflating. But the fact that the Jets cashed in with those 10 seconds left ensured that it was not deflating for them. So uh, I would say that was certainly a big development. Uh, top unit really rolling there. Velarde, you know, uh, of course he scored three goals, and that was great for him. But Sean, nine shots on goal and 11 shot attempts in the game. That's a big time development for a player who was just playing his third game in the last 18 after missing those 15 games. Uh, I thought he was excellent again today. He just brings a presence with him to the rink. Don't you think? I mean, we talked about Tyler Toffoli and the end of the presence that he has as a Stanley cup champion. And I'm going to tell you right now, I love Tyler Toffoli's game, Sean. I know we were both curious how he was going to fit in on that line with Adam Lowry. Uh, this is the most dangerous Tyler Toffoli has been in seven or eight games, let's say, since his arrival with the Jets. Yeah, sure, he had you know four goals and six points in the in the first five games, but today he was looking great. Six shots on net, seven attempts, you know, sniffing around the net. I liked, I liked how he played along the boards. I I thought that this was one of the benefits for Tyler Toffoli, Sean, in this game. Was that because Adam Lowry and Mason Appleton? They spend so much time in the offensive zone cycling that can really bring out the skill set of Tyler Toffoli. And, you know, as a trigger man on that line, I thought they had the potential to be very dangerous. I like the line a lot. Um, you know, again, we know there was a jumble back and forth with the, you know, the switch with the lines. I think it was originally just related to the extended power play. Uh, but then Rick Bonus stuck with it. And then those, I mean, it, it, it sort of coincided with the Jets kind of dipping in the game. And man, Sean, like at one point, it, the shots were 17-4 for 
for Calgary in the second period at one point, I believe. And then all of a sudden they got back to work on the power play. And then you looked up and the Jets had 33 shots and you're kind of like, okay, well, it wasn't as bad as it seemed, but a team with a little bit more skill, like they don't allow the Jets to stay close in a game like that. So uh, I, I would say they were fortunate to a degree there, but it also, you have to give them credit for turning things around. So uh, I would say the Jets did a lot of good things in the game, but I mean, again, let, let, let's keep things in perspective. Calgary has lost seven of eight. Uh, they are clearly in next year country and the Jets, you know, the level of competition they're going to be facing the rest of the way is higher than what Calgary has brought to the table for the most part. So uh, I would say that uh, incre- I'm going to count this as an incremental step forward for a team that needed one, but there are certainly like this is the trip that I'm looking forward to. I mean, not just because I'm on it. This is a big time trip. They're going to see Dallas for the last time in the regular season. They're going to see Colorado again for the last time in the regular season. But you know that's going to be the appetizer for the playoff series. So I want to see how these teams stack up post deadline, you know, see where things are at. Nashville. Nashville is probably going to be, you know, a wild card team. But they're going to want to make one last push against the Jets as well. So uh, I'm looking forward to all these games, all four games, including the one against Minnesota, even though I don't think the temperature is going to be quite as hot, Sean, just with the with the fact that Hartman has been suspended. Marcus Foligno has been shut down for the year. But like this isn't going to be a Saturday afternoon no hitter either. And for the Jets, they have to treat it like they're ramping up for the playoffs because that's what they're doing. So, I mean, again, defense pairings, we'll get into that in a minute, but Overall, I thought it was an incremental step forward for the Jets. But again, there are things that if they want to win a couple rounds or one in particular to get moving, they're going to have to tighten up a few areas of their game. And, and you know, that's been a common theme for a while now. Big time, big time. They, they, to your point, this isn't a game they would have got away with uh, against a really good team. Uh, and, and it is kind of perplexing the way that they go to sleep for these wide wide swaths of time uh but again this is like this is a building forward thing but i guess the standard that you're talking about is the the standard is the jets trying to get back to um to, to what they were before right and so in the effort to try and get back there this is not it what you saw tonight but they're taking steps towards that right and this lastly from gabriel velarde we know how good we are when we play to our standards so that's also a guy admitting that they're not at their standards. Right? Yeah. Well, and, and here you go. Well, but of course, right. Like, again, it's what I said. It's I, <laughs> I like steel. the conversation. I like the conversation that, that he has in, in like wanting more and demanding more. This For is sure. the old jets who would say things like we know we're good and stuff like that when they're pulling victories, you know, out of, out of, disaster and stuff like that they like they to me this team clearly has an understanding of what it needs to do to be very very good and so the fact that you know puts you ahead of a team that is just resting on its laurels so again that's one of the reasons i was happiest uh to see to see that from uh from uh gabe velarde uh sorry say, say i think what that, you gotta say yeah i just think that because you brought it up in the morning, it, it just along the theme of accountability, Sean, for folks who didn't see it, like let's talk about what Brendan Dillon said about the penalty. I know it's a couple games ago and we'll get back to the game, but I just think that we're talking about standards and accountability. What do you think of his answer to your question about the penalty he took and his well, response I, to it? I, I knew it was going to be good. And, and so for the people who didn't hear, I asked Brendan Dillon earlier today. And, and listen, I, I, I want to take people through the journalistic process on this yeah. one because I think it's important to do this. So I asked Brendan Dillon about about um, two games ago when he takes that penalty and ends up being, uh, you know, uh, uh, the, the penalty that the Ottawa Senators win the game on, the sixth straight loss for the Winnipeg Jets. The timing of that couldn't have been worse. It was interesting interesting I had a conversation with Kevin Sawyer afterwards and in the grand scheme of things that may not be a bad penalty to take right like sending the message that we will punish you if you come to the front of our net and taking a penalty every once in a while isn't necessarily a bad thing right because over time I think it keeps people away but the timing of that couldn't have been worse so this is Brendan Dillon very much playing the same game that he always plays 
but it catches up with them as you know, you're going to walk to the line. You're going to step over it every once in a while. If you play that kind of game and he just stepped over it at the wrong time. Now I ask him that question a, because I know from lots of conversations with Brendan Dillon, he's a very introspective guy who holds himself accountable at every single turn. Now I want people to know, I realized by bringing that up, the jets have already won a game and they're looking to win another one. We're supposed to be talking about the Calgary flames game. And here I am asking questions about two games ago when he messed up and did something that lost the game for the jets. Right. I spoke with him afterwards to say, you know, I hope you realize I bring that question up, not as a way of introducing a negative from the past, but be, be, because you're such an introspective guy and I know that you take these things seriously. I wanted you to take us through the process you go in holding yourself accountable and what you take away from that whole thing. And I just thought that his answer was really great because he gives us a peek into, you know, like someone had said, uh, uh, who was it? Someone in the room, uh, one of the J T sizzle from the jets had said, you could see he was flushed in his answer. And I don't think he was flushed because he was mad at the question. I think he was flushed because Brendan Dillon cares and he cares about that. And you're asking him about something that he knows he would like a do over, but what do you do when you can't do a do over you, you learn from it and you push yourself forward. And I think that he did that and, and even acknowledge the part about like, look, if I don't go and play that style of game up to the edge, I'm probably not in this league. So this is a fine line. Brendan Dillon has to dance when he's and has had to his entire NHL career stepped over the line in this case, cost his team a game, knew that his coach held him accountable in the press conference. Uh, but I don't need to know. I didn't need to ask the question to know that he was going to be holding himself accountable, but I want to ask it and I want him to talk about it because Brendan Dillon is a great example of how athletes should be approaching the game to make sure that they get better. Don't hide from accountability. And to me, it's the quickest path to this team being as good as they can be and where they need to be in the playoffs. If you've got that mindset and, and uh, yeah, it was, it's always a pleasure talking to Brendan. And I love the fact that he was, you know, in his accountability, he said, I felt like I let my teammates down. And, and that's, that's the thing. The reason why he was flushed is because he legitimately felt bad about that. And again, we're not asking questions like this to, to make people feel badly. You explained it perfectly. And, and, and Brendan's not going to hide from that because he already knows, like he's already moved past that, but it, we can't just tell you what he's going to feel. It, it has more feeling when it comes from him. And that I, that's why I love the answer. And, and that's why too, I mean, it's, it's all also in the way that you asked it, Sean too, right? I mean, you weren't ripping on him for the sake of ripping on him. You, you were genuinely interested in his process. And that's, I think why he appreciated it, And that's why he gave such an eloquent answer. I, I just thought it was, it was, it was apropos with the subject we were dealing with. So uh, did, anyways. did you think, did you think the joke I made with him afterwards landed? Like when I went and explained it and he was like, everything's okay. And I said, now really the, the real truth is you, you screw up so little. I had to hit you over the head with it. The one time you did, <laughs> you think he picked up on it? I'm or pretty sure like he was fine. Yeah. I talked to him <laughs> afterward and he was not, uh, he was not, in a, he was not looking for an elbow to throw your way. Uh, and you maybe, go. and maybe that's a transition to where we could go next. Yeah. Well, let's go there. Uh, what did you take away from that hit? Um, uh, Josh Morrissey at the beginning. And I can tell you this, that there's a, a behind the scenes story. I can tell about this as well, but Josh Morrissey almost seemed to be taking accountability first for getting hit. Uh, what did you take away uh, from his exp explanation and Rick's explanation after the game? Yeah. I mean, first and foremost, like I said, I, I, I would have preferred to be down there involved in the scrum myself, but just, just is, it wasn't possible to be down there. Uh, watch the video of it. Um, Josh saying, basically, I love the fact that when you're talk talking about accountability, Josh is talking about the fact that he missed a pass, you know, 10 sec seconds earlier in the shift that if he had completed the pass, there's no way for him to be hit. So, A, I love that part of it. And B, I, I like the part of it where he says, in real time, I thought I just got raw or I just got smoked. So, I mean, I also appreciate the fact that, you know, by the time either he went to the bench to the iPad or, or later on during the intermission, he saw the hit. And I think like everybody in the building in real time, I don't think it looked, you know, it, it got my attention, but I didn't think it was an obvious ejection. 
But then when you see the replay, A, it's an elbow to the chin, even though it only grazes the chin, which is what Josh said. Yeah. And B, Sean, he leaves, leaves his feet. feet. This leaves is not feet. a this is not a hit where you hit the player and your momentum takes you up and your feet leave the ice. Both feet were off the ice when the contact is made, which I'm sorry. It's not allowed under any circumstance. That's not allowed. So, I mean, I understand there's some, you know, back and forth. Ryan Huska didn't didn't like how the play was handled. But, Sean, what we saw, it, it wasn't a minor that was reviewed. It was called a minor. The officials got together. The linesman said to the referee, hey, I think it's a major. We should review it. They He announced the major. Then they reviewed it, which I think is by the book. I mean, some people will say, well, did he look on this? Did someone see a replay? I know Rick Bonas saw a replay, and that's why he flashed the five fingers at the officials. But I don't know. I mean, to me, it was an, it was an obvious major. And I, I think, too, I, I'm not an official. We have some officials like Pat Rathwell in the chat room. Part of the reason, again, it's a fully ejectionable offense because of A, leaving your feet, and B, elbowing to the head. But if you leave him in the game, this game is mayhem, don't you think? You can't leave Pospisil in that game. Yeah, I, I mean... It's a major. Yeah, yeah, it's a major. And listen, I think I've been pretty clear on this. Uh, they're trying to get rid of headshots out of the game. I, I, I say I'm consistent on this. Going back to the Brandon Dillon hit uh, that I talked about before. Another time I hit poor Brandon over the head with uh, with my analysis. But um, uh, we're trying to root this stuff out. So I, I think this is one of those situations where he starts going uh, at Josh and then Josh is in a bad spot. And instead of being like, okay, hold back, he follows through. So for me, this is no question about it. Five in a game, get him out of here. I, there may be a suspension involved with this as well. Uh, you don't want players like Josh Morrissey out because guys are taking headshots at him. I'll tell you this, the explanation of Josh Morrissey afterwards, almost taking credit for that. Uh, I've talked about this before on the podcast, but the guys who go in the off season to Adam Oates, the first thing Adam Oates teaches his players is how to not get injured. He says, it's like the boring part. You have to start out like this. And the players are like, Hey, I came to you to like work on my skills. But he, his explanation to them is listen, if you don't get injured, you're in more games. The best ability is availability. And the longer you're in, the more points you get, the more points you get, the more you get paid, the more you have an opportunity to work on your skills. The, the time you can't is when you're injured and you're on the bench and you're not part of this. So he goes and teaches his players how to not get injured, how to not put themselves in bad situations. And I bet if you asked uh, Josh Morrissey about it, uh, he'll have had a conversation within uh, probably maybe even tonight, maybe tomorrow with Adam Oates and be like, yeah, yeah, I know. I put myself in a bad spot. Uh, those guys want to protect themselves and make it make sure that they're not in that position. I'm not blaming anything on Josh, but I can tell you Josh's response is a response I would expect from an Adam Oates client, Ken. Sure. What did you think of? He did have a subtle shot at Pospisil when he talked about he's been suspended a few times. It's not very yeah. good idea for a young player to be losing money like that. I thought yeah, that was no, funny. that, that kind yeah, of funny. I mean, Pretty well, be, not just kind of he, funny. It was really funny. It was really funny because this is another <laughs> thing I was thinking about the other day. Like, there's really you don't see it as much, but there's real differentiation between the guys who make money and don't make money. Like, I've been hearing, hearing these stories yeah. lately being told to me by different people about different teams and when they go somewhere. Uh, I, I, I had someone who used to play in the league was telling me a story about how he went and one of the guys who made really big money on his team went out to the ATM and pulled out like 50 grand or something like that, or 90 grand or something stupid and was handing it to different player players right. on the team to be like, we're partying tonight. I know you could use this. And that player was like, listen, I've got my own money, but there's an understanding that certain guys make a certain amount of money. So Josh Morris, he's got a $50 million contract. He's made generational money for himself and his family and probably his grandkids and all the way on down. But he remembers what it's like to be a younger player breaking into the league yeah. and how these, 
these kind of things can add up and they can hurt a little bit. So I thought it was a funny little shot that he took there. Um, I also will just quickly do this, Ken, uh, before we transition into you saying that I give Josh Morrissey giving himself the pristine roofing wake up call uh, because he knows he doesn't want to put, want to put himself in that situation where a young player could take him out of the playoffs or something like that. So you know what that means. Time to give North End Rick the pristine roofing wake up call at one 981 6289 If you were listening to CJOB this morning, you heard North End Rick on there talking about their pay it forward program where they are handing out a free roof to someone who is in need. He's trying to spread the word, get the, get the word out there. So all you out there do your your jobs get out and spread the word about the pay it forward program for people who could use a new roof and may not have the means through which to do it this is your best bet to do it you could also call pristine roofing at 1204-237-7663 all right ken back to what you had to say yeah sorry well on the con on the on the uh you know on the subject of hits uh, let's let's deal with the lowry hit right away as well what, yeah what that red the, river uh, Kevin, i'll Kevin let you Rooney, start yeah. with that um the red river rebel asked do you think the hit on lowry should have been a penalty yeah i mean for me you know lowry kind of put himself in a bit of a vulnerable position i personally i thought it was interference um i thought the puck was in the vicinity but adam didn't have the puck so to me it was a little bit late i do think he was bracing himself for contact uh, but I mean, the contact is made shoulder to chin, so or jaw. So I mean, again, this is another great example of an issue where until the rule is crystal is a little bit more crystal clear, that's why there's gray area. What did the uh, what does this mean, Ken? Tell everyone because this is what the official did when Adam Lowry was yelling at the official. The official did this. I'm not sure what, what it means. What I think it means, it means is, it was contact. Or well, what I I think he thinks that it was like a, uh, the two of them hit and then the head went forward and hit Adam Lowry. I haven't re-seen the play. I okay. think that was his explanation on the ice. I'm not, I'm not sure that he got it wrong, but I think he was explaining to Adam what he saw. So for those of you out there who are surprised there wasn't a penalty, um, the ref, I think, thought the two of them came together in a collision and there was just like a kind of carry through of bodies that caught Adam. Uh, Adam Lowry in the chin. He was smart. To me, it's a minor that, no penalty doubt. for me. It's a minor penalty. Um, again, I, I don't, it, to me, it's similar to Vladislav. I mean, it's a different play, obviously, but similar to the Nemesnikov play that we disagreed on. I thought it was a headshot. I thought it was mutual contact. I'm not sure if I agree with that. No, but uh, he's, I think he's, the shoulder, he's, that's what he's saying. He's saying that's saying what that. the ref is saying. Sure. Yes. Right on. T. Kona Paul. Yep. Right on. Yeah. To me, it, it's, shoulder to the chin, the jaw, which again, principal point of contact is the head. But again, like I said, until there's clarity on this, I think it's, I personally think that's a minor penalty. I can understand how, why some people would hope it's a major penalty in that scenario. I thought it was a minor penalty, but I also thought that uh, Kevin Rooney was pretty fortunate that the jets just did a take a number situation because late in that game, after the, after the empty netter was scored, Kevin Rooney was on the ice. And I was quite surprised that in the last meeting of the year, somebody didn't go after him for a high, for a high hit on their captain. Quite frankly, yeah, um, I th- yeah, yeah. Now that I think about it, maybe I'm a little bit surprised by it. I think you know what I think the Jets were in a position where the what they learned from the Shifley thing a couple of games ago. Yeah, sure, I think they're just all in, focused on trying to get back to their game. They, they don't want to detract from that, and I think what they're seeing. Uh, in the flames was a team that was derailed tonight by their penalties. Like that's a close game and the flames. Um, sorry. I just had to, uh, I, I, I don't know how to pronounce his last name, but the, the second penalty that they score on who's the flames player who takes that penalty. Um, egregious turnover right before that he has the puck no one is near him there's three flames wide open and he turns and no look passes it to a jet which starts the grind of a shift where they can't get the puck off them and then he takes the penalty on Shifley and that ends up being the game winner in the game uh this when I talk about the Jets how they wouldn't have got away with this against other teams this is a guy that the flames are trying out in the absence of shipping out you know, a good chunk of their defense core. And they're throwing a guy in there that I'm hearing probably doesn't have a good 
a good chance at being around next year. This is a guy, you know, maybe having a cup of coffee in the NHL, pulling an absolutely boneheaded play and then making the error to try and fix his boneheaded play and ending up costing his team the game. Now, Brendan Dillon, when we're talking about him costing the team the other the other day with that penalty, there's at least a purpose behind what he's doing. This was just a bad player making bad plays, scrambling to try and uh, uh, to try and make up against a, a superior team. Um, I wouldn't expect those kind of events going forward if you're the Winnipeg Jets. Can give Sweet Lewis shout out. Nikita Ohodiuk. The yes. guys told us the pronunciation a few times, and I think I still accidentally butchered you, it. But uh, yeah, I did my best. I did my yes. best. So okay, um, for folks who have realty needs, they'd like to have met. Whether you're buying, selling, or curious what that coast in the corner is going for, you can contact Lou Ferlin, our main man at Royal LePage and Ambic Realty. Tell him Kenny and Rennie sent you. 204-791-9971 or at the office 204-989-5000. His email is Lou at louferlin.ca. That's L O U at L O U F U R L A N dot C A. Lou Ferlin, excellent realtor, excellent human being, and excellent supporter of the community, including this podcast. All right. Totally uh, funny one that I want to get into here <laughs> through the, uh, I'm going to give the Cambrian uh, sure. Credit Union teamwork award to this one or sorry the the payoff the payoff was um was getting uh, uh Cole Perfetti on a line again with Nikolai Ehlers as it pays off with a goal and hey if you're looking to pay off high interest credit cards or debt we suggest you go talk to our friends at Cameron Credit Union about their payoff loan they can show you how taking out a loan to pay off your debt actually gets you debt free faster and you can save thousands of dollars go to cambrian.mb.ca to book an appointment online um I thought it was absolutely hilarious that uh the, like the truth serum on full display with Rick Bonus, who talked about Cole Perfetti and Nick Ehlers and how they did not work for a long time. And it's one of the things that had Cole Perfetti out of the lineup. And then they get on a line to, together for just a split second and boom, it ends up in a goal. Cole Perfetti with a great play coming off the boards, beating his defender to a spot, getting the puck, setting up Nick Ehlers. It's in the back of the net. So Rick bonus gives it another look saying, okay, maybe something's awakened here. And is like, yeah, no, that doesn't work. So if you want to have an understanding of what's happening with the Nick Ehlers going up to the top line, Kyle Connor coming down to the second line, interestingly enough, with Cole Perfetti in the lineup, a lot of it has to do with not necessarily, I know a lot of people think it's about getting Nikolai Ehlers, Mark Shifley, and Gabe Velarde back on a line together, but it has a lot to do with while Cole Perfetti is there, the head coach doesn't think he works with Nikolai Ehlers, uh, so that's why you're finding Kyle Kyle Connor went back up to the first line for a bit, found his way back down onto the second line because the coach doesn't think that that works. But it's a way of me getting into the conversation about Perfetti, Ken, what you saw from him tonight and what is maybe changing around the way the Jets plan to use him based on his performance. Yeah, it's interesting. I know you talked about this with uh, with our pal Jeffy today, uh, Jeff Merrick on the Jeff Merrick Show on Fan 590. Um it's super interesting, like you said. So they, they got out for that shift together and scored a goal immediately. Uh, and then they proceeded to have shots for and against at four to one uh, against and scoring chances for six to one against before they got shifted back. Uh, I liked a lot about Cole's game again today. Uh, do I think he's done enough in two games to cement himself as a top six forward when game one starts? No, I don't. I think he's trending upward, uh, which is totally fair. Uh, is he there? No. I mean, he's still working on it. I mean, today, like, let's look at the ice time. I mean, Rick Bonus will tell you. Uh, today, Cole Perfetti had 13.52 on 18 shifts. He had three shots on goal, four attempts. He had a hit. Uh, I liked a lot about his game personally. Um, but, I mean, I'm not 100% sure. Like, we need to know, A, is is Nino Niederreiter, I assume he's going to be ready for game one. Oh, and yeah. And then I'm with you, Sean. I mean, that line's going to be together. I, I loved out what Tyler Toffoli brought to that line, Adam Lowry's line today with Mason Appleton. I thought the trio clicked really well. But I expect game one's lineup to include Tyler Toffoli in the top six. And and then we're not sure if Cole Perfetti's playing, right? Like, these are the facts. We're not sure if he's in the lineup. I mean, I personally think he's a consideration for the fourth line. But based on what Colorado has done, Sean, and this is part of your argument for sure, 
it's a grinding fourth line with Trent and, and Duhame on it. So are the Jets going to counter with a skilled line? I mean, they might do it for the home games. I don't think that on the if they start on the road, that the Jets won't go for a more traditional, energetic fourth line, even though that all three of those guys on the line will still be double-digit goal scorers. Um, so again, I, I think that Perfetti has acquitted himself quite well, but I don't see Cole Perfetti jumping ahead of Tyler Toffoli at this very moment. Um, you know, can he do something in the last six games to change the coaching staff's minds? I mean, it's possible, but like, let's not kid ourselves. Tyler Toffoli was brought in to bolster the fourth or the, the top six offense. Yeah. So I think he'll be given every opportunity to do that. And he should be given every opportunity to do that. And, you know, people can say whatever they want about how things have been handled. I mean, Cole went cold for a long time. Like, we're not ignoring that either. Doesn't mean he's a bad player. It means he's a good player who ran into a couple of roadblocks and speed bumps. And he's powered through them. I love the mental fortitude that he has shown. A lot of young players could have just, you know, shut down for the year mentally and not been able to handle this. So I love the fact that he has bounced back and and shown his offensive upside. But, I mean, Tyler Toffoli is a Stanley Cup champion who has 31 goals this year. So I applaud the fact that Cole Perfetti with a cold streak is at, you know, 17 and counting. I don't see him jumping ahead of Tyler Toffoli right now uh, when it comes to game one of the Stanley Cup playoffs. But that's the beauty of the season. Things can change. There are injuries. We weren't expecting Nino Niederreiter to be out. The guy is almost always in the lineup, and he's fortunate that the skate cut wasn't worse. But I'm seeing progress from Cole Perfetti, and that's good news for A, Cole Perfetti, and B, for the Winnipeg Jets, because it gives them another legitimate option for their top six. And it also gives them an option for the fourth line if they choose to run up more of a skilled line on the fourth line for the home games. I have to say, I think this is a tentative situation and I wouldn't want to be bones in this situation because I'll say that I had a couple people uh, um, or reach out to me and say, well, how's it looking with the whole take on not saying that uh, Perfetti should be in for every game. And I was like, okay, you're right. Four periods is enough for me to erase everything he's done before that and everything going forward. Um, but, but I will say this, Ken, I'm a, I'm a really, really big believer on if you take a guy and give him an opportunity and he doesn't mess up that opportunity, never mind, he continues capitalizing over and over again on that opportunity. I hate the idea of taking a guy out of, out of the lineup. Now, because Nino Niederreiter isn't coming back tomorrow, there's going to be a little bit of time with this. So there's time to play with this and time for Cole Perfetti to maybe slow down and have that one game where Rick Bonus can say to him, okay, yeah, you know, didn't have your best game. We're going to take you out of the lineup again. But this is a tricky... Cole Perfetti looked good tonight. Confident moving quickly through open eyes like he's looking the quickest that i've seen him all season his decision making is point on that goal that he sets up is just such a great play where he smart plays pass. well on the boards makes a smart pass but it's what he does to get into the position to get that open ice with the puck to make that pass how he beats his man to that spot there's a lot he did that really impressed me tonight and make no bones about it. He's been one of the Jets' better offensive players the last two games. If he continues to do that and you pull him out of the lineup because in the past he wasn't working out that well, I don't like what that does to a team whose offense I would suggest is fragile right? The Jets have never really been able to get the first and second line going this year. If you've got a guy who's a case of it working, and, and I think it's the same thing as kind of breaking up Ehlers and Shifley and Velarde when they were working, um, you break that up and, and it doesn't always come back together, right? You smash the plate and you put it back together and every once in a while there's some missing pieces. It doesn't always just fit back together that easily. So it's a tentative situation because if you think of it from the other side of this, Tyler Toffoli, like a can, uh, they look good and he, he fit in well with that line. Give him credit, give him his flowers for that. But that line did not look like the pressing force that they need to be. Cause the whole plan of the jets is this send Adam Lowry's line out against the other team's top line. Think of Anse Kopitar last game, 
totally erased Kopitar. Kopitar got out for one shift quickly uh, in an early change against Kyle Connors line, and boom, it's in the back of the net, right? Adam Lowry's job is going to be going in to take on the top line away for the other team. And then the bet is, I don't think the opposition second and third line can outscore our first or second line. So what it looks like against Colorado is if Adam Lowry can go in and erase Nathan McKinnon's line, the way they're able to do, even if you're able to hold them in check. Well, now you've got a third line with who is it? O'Connor at center. Zach Parisi is on the wing. Do you think that line and miles Wood? Colton Parisi and Miles Wood, do you think that line is going to be able to outdo Kyle Connor, Sean Monahan, and either Perfetti or Toffoli? I don't. I think that that's going to be a clear win for the Jets over the series. Uh, and, and it's going to become, this is a whole other thing, but Jets, if they could get home ice advantage, it would be important because having that first change for them, that could really turn into a home and home series. I digress. I'm getting away from Toffoli and, and uh, Perfetti, but you can't bring in a guy like Tyler Toffoli. Who's got 30 goals this year. Who's 31. got a Stanley cup. Well, I, I'm Sorry, saying he's yes. a 30 goal player. Um, Who's got? Who is a thirty-goal player? Uh, has done it before. Um, has won a cup and has had this history of being a really great playoff player. And then sit him or move him down to the fourth line before you know to make way for Cole Perfetti, because then his agent and he's going to be like, "What did you go get me for? You had Cole Perfetti here, and he has a couple good games, and now I'm expendable." That like this is if they were to do that, it would be embarrassing a player, right? And what what you put in jeopardy now is every player that comes forward in future trade deadlines. If the Jets need to go pick up a guy and pick up a star and add him in, well, they'll be like, well, remember what you did to Tyler Toffoli there? And then some people will start saying, well, didn't you kind of do the same thing to Kevin Hayes when you put him on the fourth line? And that's something that's a that's a reputation the Jets don't want to get and will not, I can tell you right now, will not risk getting. So Tyler Toffoli is not going to go into the press box for for Perfetti. So I think this is a bit of a tentative situation. I think honestly, if you're Rick Bonus and the coaching staff, you're hoping that by the time Nino Niederreiter gets back, because he will go back to that third line and they will put that line together, you're hoping that Cole Perfetti has cooled off again and given you an excuse to take him out of the lineup. Because to your point, can I still think that today is more evidence of what I was arguing the last time that you need to put Cole Perfetti in a competition? for top six. And if someone gets injured, he goes in right away. But if someone is really stinking and you need to set a, set a message, maybe you can sit a guy for one game and put Cole Perfetti in, but you are not taking Tyler to fully out of this lineup in place of Cole Perfetti. It is not happening. The ramifications of doing it would be problematic, but I also contend the ramifications of taking Cole Perfetti out when he's become an offensive driver down the stretch here just because he's the youngest guy and kind of the last guy through the door has potential effects on this team's t- tentative and fragile offense as well. Yeah, I mean, but I mean, on the flip side of that, Sean, even with Tyler Toffoli going six games without a point, he's he's outperformed Cole in the same window of time, production wise, if you're talking about the offense. Right? Five goals and two assists. Cole's two and two for four, right? So like even you're, when he's you're talking about you're talking about the entire time that he's been I'm talking like, about this block. Here. I mean, even not even not the whole time. I mean, even just the block of time we're talking about where Cole's elevated who, his game. Who Tafoli? Tafoli has in he's got five goals and and seven points or whatever in the in that same window as Cole elevating his game. Like the Cole, last couple of games, are you talking about? Tyler even Toffoli just the, had gone pointless. The 10-game block. Yes, I know points. that. Yes, but the 10-game block, if we're talking about the 10-game block. Yeah, I'm not talking about the 10-game block. Well, okay, I, I just don't think that we can ignore it. And here's my okay, other Okay, all right. Sorry, yeah, sorry. No. I'm just going to address that really quickly here. Tyler Toffoli had five points in two blowout victories over the the Coyotes sure. and the, the Columbus Blue Jackets. He struggled to establish himself with the... It, it would be, I would think, a mistake to suggest that Tyler Toffoli has arrived and figured it out with the Jets. I think it's quite the opposite. Agreed. I think there were two games that he blew things up, and so those numbers look great, getting five points in two games against two to opposition that post trade deadline had essentially, you know, have 
mailed in the rest of the season, but he's struggled since then. And so Definitely. while he's struggling, he gets something here tonight. And now in the, in the tail end of his struggles, Cole Perfetti walks in here and has suddenly figured a lot of things out. I think that changes it. I don't think you can really look at, well, sorry you should look at the 10 game block because everyone who's freaking out, it's the same thing that I said off the, be the, off the beginning when someone said to me, well, how do you take him out? And I was like, you're right. Four periods have convinced me uh, Cole Perfetti should never come out of the lineup. But uh, I'm just saying, I think it's dangerous if Cole Perfetti keeps going on at this click and then Nino Niederreiter is back two games from now and you take Cole Perfetti out or even bounce him down to the fourth line where we know he doesn't have that effectiveness because he needs to play with the kind of players that are in the top six. I think it can be for an offensively fragile team tricky to take him out of the lineup if he's still going at the clip he's going at. Sure, but my, my point too is today, if you have Cole in the game as a fourth line player, he can be a consideration to get bumped up into the top six if one of those guys is not going. So I, I think that oh, there's, yeah. va there's value in having him in the lineup that way. So, anyways, and I'm not, yeah, I'm not here, you're I'm talking not... mid game, you're yes, talking mid game exactly. adjustments yeah. for sure. Because like you said, but I mean, if, if it's a guy not going and that guy happens to be Nikolai Ehlers, what does Nikolai Ehlers look like on the fourth line? Right. If it's Kyle Connor, if it's, you know, like, it's, I, I don't know, like, it's not that simple. It's not that simple to be like, well, we've got him in the lineup so we can bump him up and then we move Sean Monaghan down to the fourth line, right? Like it's it's a little tricky. And in the meantime, you don't have the fourth line playing the kind of game you probably want the fourth line playing. Right. But I mean, you're not scratching one of those guys for Cole Perfetti to go into the top six. Exactly. But if he's on the fourth line, you can give him some shifts with offensive players. So I think that's a, a situation that scenario that's worth considering. Yeah. And again, to Foley today, I, I love the fact that he was on that that third line, the checking line. It helped get him some more puck touches and he was looking for a shot more. I mean, Paul Maurice used to do this with Patrick Liney when he would put him out there with Brandon Tanev and Adam Lowry when he wasn't going because he wanted to simplify his game. That's what we saw today. And again, how, where that goes moving forward, that that's up to Tyler Toffoli. But today, the previous games, when he went those six games without a point and seven without a goal, he wasn't dangerous. Today, he was dangerous. And I don't care that he scored a, a goal that bounced off a stick of Rasmus Anderson and off the skate of, of Mackenzie Weger. I mean, he was making a smart play. Nemesnikov was open in front, so it just happened as to hit a couple players instead of Nemesnikov. I just thought he was way more dangerous looking for his shot today, and that's an important step forward for him. Just yeah. like it was, it was an important step forward for Perfetti to stack a couple of, of smart, strong games here. I mean, all he can do is help his cause, and he's helping his cause right now. Um, sorry, I I just I have to send that off. Kenny's water ball here says Perfetti on the second, to Foley on the third, Nino on the fourth. If things don't work, you can always switch whatever you want to Foley to the third, Nino to the third, Perfetti to the fourth. It's not that big a problem. Uh, BA split says if the third line produces with Toff, he's gonna stay there. I couldn't disagree with this more. Like it is not about that line becoming a scoring line. It is about what that line does in grinding down, taking their pound of flesh and shutting down the opposition. Now, I don't think Tyler to full, like let me be clear on this tonight. Tyler to is a great scoring winger. So on that line, I would expect him to increase the ability of that line to score, but I also would expect him to limit the ability of that team to grind and take the pound of flesh away out of the other team the way that a big, heavy, grinding body like Nino Niederreiter does alongside a speedy, grinding player like uh, Mason Appleton and the ultimate big, grinding guy in, in Adam Lowry. The Jets, I can tell you right now, are not going to mess with the effectiveness of this. So everyone can do whatever they want, but Rick Bonus is not going to go out of his way to solve the problem of keeping Cole Perfetti in the lineup by breaking apart the thing that he feels str most strongly about and the thing he believes in most with this team. It's not as simple as, hey, the third line is going to score now. It's what they do to help them win hockey games. And I suggest tonight... A lot of people see it as an example of, wow, he sparked the scoring on that line. Uh, this is the, the Calgary Flames 
This is not a good example, and I don't think they look particularly grinding against the Calgary Flames tonight. Now, maybe if they go into another game, we can see and Tyler Toffoli can go play that game. I highly doubt, just by the kind of body he is, the kind of style he plays, that Tyler Toffoli is going to be able to play the role of Nino Niederreiter the way Nino Niederreiter does. Would they maybe get a couple more goals here or there? Maybe, but... I also contend that their ability to lean and bring down the top players of other teams would not be as effective. So I don't think people are thinking about this the right way. People are thinking about it just like, move this guy here and they'll score more and move that guy here, blah, blah. Round and round we go. That is the opposite of what the Winnipeg Jets coaches would be thinking. This is, to me, it's it's an offhand. Like, yeah, you can just move this guy here, 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 and it's going to change the way you score. No. This is the Jets are a third line first team. This if they beat the Colorado Avalanche, it will be because that third line does a good job of erasing Nathan McKinnon and their depth wins out elsewhere. It's not about the third line coming to try and outscore other people. Yeah, and it's minimized. I mean, I know you're using the word erase. I just it, there's going to yeah, be a hard. I, uh, it's a, uh, yes, it's very it's, difficult to erase Nathan McKinnon and and they did this McCart. year and they didn't this year, but. They, they, to your point, them minimized routes. them to the yeah. point that the Jets depth was able to win out what we've seen from the Jets before. I like the chat, like the, the matchup I actually think is one of the better matchups the Jets could have in the first round going against them. Because you take a look at that line, the scoring, the, the, that team, the scoring drops off. You go to the Dallas stars, the scoring doesn't. Sure. Through the top three lines, the scoring does not drop off. They've got three. So even if you send Adam Lowry against the top line, Jason Robertson's line of the Dallas Stars, they still have two lines that could very well outscore the next, the, the first and second line of the Winnipeg Jets. And they've got a grand, grinding fourth line. And they've got a big grinding defense core who are capable of moving the puck. And they've got a goaltender that if he wakes up could be very, very, very much a problem. So, so the third line will be important and it will be the key in the series against the uh, uh, Colorado Avalanche. If, if they end up playing them and I keep telling you that's who they're going to end up playing. Right. And um, just, Ken, just wrapping that up. It, it, some people will say, well, what about to Foley and move Appleton down? Well, you might score more, but you need Appleton's speed against the McKinnon line. So it's not as simple as doing that either. Appleton's the and vanguard. his defensive awareness. He's the vanguard. He's the first guy in on the check. Yeah. Right. Tyler Toffoli is not going to be that guy. He's not as fast as Mason Appleton. He doesn't play the same kind of game. Mason Appleton goes in. He's the first point of contact. He tries to separate the man and the puck. Nino Niederreiter or Adam Lowry gets in second to try and get it, and then they grind it and get it to the other guy, either Lowry to Niederreiter or Niederreiter to Lowry. Now they have possession. Now it's like we're big, strong bodies. Come try and get it off us and if you and if you don't they don't care about scoring they just care about the idea that Anze Kopitar the other night played defense the entire game yeah that's all he did the entire time that's what they want from that line so people keep talking about Toffoli and moving guys this there and scoring and doing this and doing that that's not what Rick Bonus is looking for it's why he's always been preaching about getting the top two lines scoring and he's not talking about saying we need to create more goals from the third line he doesn't need that. He doesn't want that. He wants them to do that. It's the job of the other two to put the points on the board. We got to move on. Ken Johnson group got you covered play of the game. What do you got? Uh, I'm not sure if it's a play in general, but uh, I mean, again, we've been talking about the defense core and the changes and kind of a little bit of bouncing around. So, you know, I, I'm just going to give Colin Miller the got you covered for, you know, I think it was six healthy scratches in a row coming back in. Uh, I thought it was not a flashy game for Colin Miller, but I thought it was a steady game for Cal Colin Miller. And those are the types of games he needs to play if he wants to be in the lineup a little bit more. Uh, no shots on net, but two hits and a block shot in uh, 12 minutes and 16 seconds today. He was on for one goal against, but uh, just going to go with that. I, I didn't have a ton of other uh, individual plays were, were not it's something that I had uh, locked in. Maybe you had one. That you can no, no, give me an assist me. on. Uh, just before that, Destry Ludit says Landeskog, I hear, is done. I'm not sure 
where Destry is hearing that everything that I've heard is that his return is within the timeline of the playoffs. I'm not saying that could change or couldn't change. And maybe it has, maybe Destry's hearing something. I have done a quick check and I haven't. It was May is what we were hearing. It's not going to be for the first round is the the expectation. Yes, exactly. So it's probably not something the Jets have to worry about unless uh, Colorado finds a way to catch uh, uh, the stars, which I don't think is happening either. Anyways, that's Ken had the, we've got you covered the Johnson group. Got you covered play of the game. Do you run a small business in Canada? Look to Canada's number one employee benefits plan, Chambers Plan, to give you a competitive edge. Chambers Plan is the simple, stable, smart choice for over 30,000 businesses countrywide. Visit chamberplan.ca to learn more. That is the Johnson Group Got You Covered play of the game. The Kenny and Rennie OGs. All right, Ken, getting to the keg save of the game. What do you got? I think it's, I mean, some folks may not like it, but... I think the best save was made by Dustin Wolf when he went down in the splits and he still found a way to get his glove on the Kyle Connor chance. Uh, at so the he end of didn't the... go down in the splits. His he own fell. player, his oh, own player him. actually kicked his feet out from behind him. So he ends up on his keister because he gets tripped by his own player. And to your point, still finds a way to make the save on Kyle Connor I, I, on the power play. I thought that was just an exceptional save. Yes. Connor Hellebuck steady today, especially in the second when they were getting outplayed massively. Uh, but I thought the, in terms of the fun uh, element of the save, I thought that that save by Dustin Wolf was uh, was my choice personally. I mean, you could almost give it to hit on the Gabe Velarde's second goal. You could almost give it him the the save of the game for his save on the initial redirection, and then stops the next shot with the paddle out of the air right. before Gabe Velarde. And that I'm foreshadowing what's happening here, but Gabe Velarde, the way that he stayed with that puck was something else. I'm going to give it to Hellebuck on the three on one. Oh, uh, sure. The yeah. shot comes in and, and only because it wasn't the nicest save of the game, uh, but it almost leaks through and there's a player waiting right there in that situation, that player's playing. It's almost like that pass. He's playing to have that shot. Yeah over on that side, drop down into the crease. It's not like a pad uh, 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 pass where you fire it off the pad and it redirects and goes to a guy who's skating in. That's one of those ones that he's trying to get to drop right there and have the guy tap in. And the way that Connor Hellebuck ensures that it's not there for that to happen would have been an entirely different game if they would have scored at that point there. And that right was on. a three on one. Was it on the, uh, at the tail end of the, uh, of a penalty, I believe oh, it was, it was a short-handed yeah. was it Rooney? Rooney's anyway, chance, maybe. Yeah. Anyway, that uh, that is the keg save of the game. Uh, doesn't matter what we think, though. Matters what you think. Share with us your hashtag, the keg save of the game. You're automatically entered to win a fifty dollars gift gift certificate, usable at any of the three fine keg locations here in the city of Winnipeg. Uh, and that brings us to our winner, who is Ryan C. Ryan C. You know what to do. Direct message me at S N Sean Reynolds. Send me your full name. Send me your email, and I will have the keg send you a fifty dollars gift certificate, usable at any of their three fine keg locations here in the city of Winnipeg. Each location finer than the last. And Ken, that brings us to our TCB lamp later of the night. What do you got? Yeah, Velarde's goal. Absolute beauty. I mean, like I said, I, I love the play that uh, Perfetti made too, Sean, to get it to Ehlers. And I, <laughs> it's a change up, but it's a beauty goal by Ehlers because he shoots right away and fools Dustin Wolf. But uh, I love the hand eye from Velarde and the stick to is the beauty of that goal, right? Yeah. Uh, great tip on the Morrissey shot and then just sticks with it. And you talk about repeatable goals, Sean, in the playoffs, point shots must get through and tips must be made because you're not beating a goalie cleanly very often in the playoffs. So um, Gabriel Velarde and a absolute beautiful game by him. Uh, nine shots and, like I said, 11 attempts. That was an absolute beauty for him. Uh, and just one more for good measure because I know I, you know, I did have to point out the fact that the Shifley, Ehlers, and Velarde line was outshot uh, 11 to 1 in the last game. Today, 7 2 in, on the good side of shots for and against. So I uh, just wanted to make sure we got that in there. Scoring chances 4 5 to 2 for the line. And I like the Velarde goal, is my choice for the lamp later. Um, that's a great one. I'm going to agree with you, but before I do Destry, Destry Lufit, uh, or Lutit, uh, Lushit, I don't know. Uh, time for the headband, Sean, let's make it a late breaking version. Uh, Sean's headband version of the Kenny and Randy show. <laughs> Thank you. 
Love to see Tristan rock. And they're going to see him down at the Kenny and Rennie event, which is happening this Saturday, the final Kenny and Rennie live event, uh, which is sold out. Uh, thank you so much to all of you for making sure that was a sellout. This was just a long way of me saying, I completely agree with Ken. Listen, the redirect on that is absurd. Like major league. Like not only does he see where the puck is going, reach out with his stick. The further the, 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 the something is away from your body, the harder it is for you to get your eye, uh, hand eye coordination going. He reaches out and redirects it at an absurdly sharp angle that is going to go in. If it's not saved has the wherewithal to then pick the puck out of the air to put it into the empty net where Wolf stops it, gets his paddle on it. And then once again, picks the puck out of the air to put it in the empty net one, two, three times. Like Ken, what do you think the chances are of doing that? A like one to 100,000 of like getting your stick on a puck three times in a row like that. But B how many players in the NHL do you think would have been able to do that? Not once, not twice, but thrice. Like, are we talking exactly. 5%, 2%, one percent like that was amazing and it's just vintage um gabe velarde creating chaos at the front of the net capitalizing on that chaos that's my tcb transcanner brewing company lamp lighter of the game uh doesn't matter what i think matters what you think share with us your lamp lighter and you are automatically entered to win a frosty delicious eight pack of lamp lighter amber ale brought to you by our friends at transcanner brewing company if you can't wait for kenny and rennie to gift you your eight pack head on down to their tap room grab a beer while you're down there grab some pizza grab some food it's a great environment great people as you will find out if you're one of the lucky people who got tickets down to the live show this weekend uh thank you to all of you uh who bought those tickets and it is time to announce our winner of the uh, um, the Lampy, and that would be our main man, Marshall. Marshall, you know what to do. I know you're listening. I think you texted me earlier, but Marshall direct messaged me at SN Sean Reynolds. Send me your full name. Send me your email. I will send you a voucher for when you get back into the city of Winnipeg for a frosty, delicious a pack of lamp lighter amber ale. Brought to you by our friends at Transcanner Brewing Company. It is the nectar of the gods. Kenny, anything to say before we go? No, I mean, Jets clinched a playoff spot today. That's their next step in the journey. Now we see what happens in terms of the seeding, and I'm with you. I mean, we both expect the Jets to be playing the Colorado Avalanche. Uh, there is one more meeting to go. I mean, the I did look at the Avalanche schedule. They, they've got a tough uh, tough road ahead. Two games with the Oilers, one with the Vegas Golden Knights, but they've been playing great hockey. They had another big win today, and uh, so did Nashville. So fired up about the trip. I'm sorry I won't be joining you on Saturday. I'll be joining you. Just I won't be in the building with you, which is, you know, part of the gig, as we know. But uh, it's exciting time of the year. Had a great lunch with our pal Ryan Leslie today. Um, and, yeah, we're fired up. Let's go. Playoff time. Um, and run here. Let's get these six games going, and uh, it'll be good. You're bailing on me, but Hammy's going to oh. be there, folks. Uh, so I Hammy still loves you. you. Yeah, that's uh, right. So anyway, um, <laughs> I've got something quick to say before we go. That This whole, like, clinching thing and all the questions, uh, I just, I hate that storyline. I just hate it because, I like, imagine this, okay? Because the Jets didn't clinch the playoffs tonight with that victory. The Jets clinched the playoffs before the end of the game when the St. Louis Blues lost to the Nashville Predators. Um, and they were going to clear the, the clinch the playoffs regardless, be, unless someone actually thought out there the Winnipeg Jets were going to lose every single game going forward, and the St. Louis Blues were going to win every single game going forward. Just like last year when I told you early in, sorry, not early, but in January when people were worried about the Jets dropping that they were going to fall out of the playoffs, it wasn't going to happen. It was almost statistically impossible. The Jets made the playoffs by January this year. And just imagine a scenario here, folks. Imagine that the Winnipeg Jets, because people are talking about the importance of them not backing into the playoffs. Imagine a scenario by which the Jets lost here tonight and then the next six games they went out and started playing that perfect Winnipeg Jets Rick bonus brand of hockey. The blueprint got back to that and stole away home ice advantage from the Colorado avalanche. How many of those guys are sitting there thinking like, wow, everything's going great, but man, 
we backed into the playoffs that night that we clinched the playoffs, but we lost that game. Like it's such a ridiculous thing. The only thing that mattered when it came to them winning and clinching the playoffs was for the people in that very building tonight, because when they played the clinched logo and that sound that Gabe Velarde joked about, it gave the crowd an opportunity to cheer and they would have cheered anyways, but the cheers were a little more lusty because they'd just come off a victory as well. But this whole thing, I don't think there's a single Rick bonus said it after the game. He knew the jets were going to make it. I don't think there's a single player out there who would be really, really disappointed had they lost tonight, but they clinched the playoffs only because the St. Louis Blues lost. Ridiculous storyline, uh, and I'm glad it's behind us, I guess I have to say. That's it for me. Uh, crowd, you did a great job here tonight in the chat room, as you always do. Kenny, you did a great job, and I will end this the way so that you, I buddy. always do. Thank you very much. I will end this the way that I always do, which is to say if you appreciate the conversation happening in this place, in this space, please Please appreciate the contributions by our sponsors who fight to keep the conversation going in this space. For us, that's Vittorio Rossi, Cambrian Credit Union, Pristine Roofing, Sweet Lou Ferlin, Johnston Group, The Keg, and Transcanner Brewing Company. Thank you, Rossi, for always having my back here. Thank you, everybody. Uh, next, next game. Next game is the Kenny and Rennie live show. Indeed. I can't wait for it. It's going to be a ton of fun. A Minnesota wild game. Maybe there will be a little bit of heat. I'm not sure how much I expect that. But regardless, there will be heat in the chat room afterwards. There will be heat in that room because I know there's always someone in there. I don't know why they do it because they always leave with their tail in between their legs. But always someone who tries to take on Rennie's takes. I'm sure it'll happen again. Bring the heat, everybody. I'm looking forward to it. It's going to be fun as it always is. Can't wait to see you there. Can't wait to see the rest of you right here in this space after the game. We will see you then.